Hello and welcome to Politics War Room with James Carville and I'm Al Hunt. This week our guest is the former chair of the President's Council of Economic Advisors in the Clinton administration uh, and a professor at Berkeley in the London School of Economics, Professor Laura Tyson. Remember, we love taking your questions. So write in a politics war room at gmail.com or send a tweet at Politicon for next week's show. And we're going to get to as many as we can, but don't forget to tell us where you're from. Please check out the links to our recent sponsors. Uh, we really thank you for supporting these sponsors. It really helps make this podcast happen. So check them out in our show notes. Please tell your friends about us and remind them to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcast. James, New York Times, Sienna Paul shows incredibly a tie race right now between uh, Joe Biden and Donald Trump. You know, you can pay too much attention to polls this far out. And I think Simon Rosenberg correctly points out the Times may be a little bit of an outlier. If you look at those other polls that he cites, Biden probably has a three or four point lead. But even a three or four point lead is not as um, impressive as one would think it should be. Uh, if I had to bet in a, in a what's going to happen in 15 months, always dicey. I think Biden has the upper hand. Trump's got a lot of bad things ahead. He's going to get indicted twice more. House Republicans will probably overplay their hand. Lord knows what things he might say or people he'll surround himself with. But if I'm a Democrat, there's a couple things that worry me. Uh, probably the number two thing that worries me is uh, what we can talk to our guest, Laura Tyson, about is a possibility still that there could be a downturn next year. But the number one thing that worries me is if Joe Biden were ever to have a moment like Mitch McConnell had last week where he just froze. Uh, I think it hurts McConnell's leadership. I think it would be absolutely, if not fatal, near fatal for Biden's presidency. So he just has to hope that the health um, holds up. Uh, the poll is not an encouraging one. Well, that poll, to be fair, has kind of emerged as, you know, one, not maybe the best thought of media poll is out there now. I, I don't think that's always been the case with the Times polling, but I, I, I think when people are like go back and do this analysis, it, this poll does very, very well. And as you know, I'm not, don't have a, predisposition to be favorable toward the New York Times, but, and I, I, yeah, I don't know what's going to happen in 16 months. I, I, Ed Kilgore, uh, who's a very good commentator, I read, I read everything he says, he, you know, he doesn't think that Trump's had a better chance right now to be elected than any other time. And yeah, I don't have any idea, but uh, you know, assume everybody stays healthy. You know, you, you, it worries the crap out of me, and no one seems to want to address it. The other is uh, the, the black enthusiasm is, is tepid at the polls, is really, really tepid. The youth enthusiasm is not great. And if we, you don't have those two things, you, you could set yourself up for something bad happening. And, and I, I think people are far too nonchalant that, well, it's probably going to work out, you know, when you stop and you think about it. Yeah, but you know, okay, but maybe. And, and I always tell people, so what's it? That, you know, I, I don't put percentages because it just, I don't think it means anything, but just for the fun of it, you say, well, it's 60, 40 Biden. No one would take a medical test with a 40% chance of a catastrophic result. And this would be catastrophic. And it's not getting any better. It's just not. And somebody, and you're right, if you have one semi-neurological event, no telling what would happen, it's always a scare. Uh, you have a recession, which is, you know, not the, a real scare. And this son of a bitch comes back in office, and it's the end of the United States Constitution. No question. No question. I don't think a lot of smart people are nonchalant about it right now. Um, and I, I think there, there is worry, there is concern. Um, I do think that, that if you're a Republican, if you're a Trumpite, there ought to be concern too. I mean, these next two indictments, first one's going to come from Fulton County, I suspect, uh, in August. And I think Jack Smith may not be far behind on January the 6th. And one thing we've learned from the previous Mar-a-Lago indictment 
you knew a lot about it beforehand. It was much worse than you thought. And you even it even got worse last week when you found out that Trump was trying to uh, uh, <clears throat> sabotage the video. Uh, he was covering up something after he'd been subpoenaed. My guess is that particularly Jack Smith's January 6th indictment, we're going to find out things that go far beyond anything we know. Now, does that affect Trump's base? No, not really. They'll be with him no matter what. Uh, but I think it does affect those people on the margins who uh, don't particularly like Biden and um, say, you know, maybe we need some change. I think they're going to be I think they're going to be rattled by this. So they've got problems, too. Yeah, you know, I, so I, there's been a lot already that should rattle any should rattle, rattle a hibernating bear right now. In spite of all the indictments from Manhattan, the indictments from South Florida, the stories, the, 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 the speaking indictment, the crushing rendition of facts, the January 6th, he's still tied. He's still tied. Or but within in, three or in four In the face points. of all of this evidence, I, 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 I cannot tell you, I, 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 you, you may be right, but right now, in, in, in spite of the fact that we have, like, the best economy you can ever see in your life, it's freaking tied. I, I don't know what else to make of that, but I am panicked. I'll just be honest with you. In cooler heads, uh, I'm sure will prevail, but it, 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 we know a lot now, and this son of a bitch is, a, you know, 50-50 to win. So if you're panicked, what do you do? I, well... <laughs> I, you know, we, 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 you got to think about it. You live in a democracy. It is abundantly clear that the public does not want a Biden-Trump choice. It, it, and if you're right and Trump just, just can't withstand it and they get someone else that, that's marginally not crazy, we'd lose this freaking election. I, I mean, I, I, I'm, just, I'm just saying it's... <laughs> I, I, I can't be talked off the ledge. It's bad. And I look, I, I think it could get better. And I, I, I don't know, but with everything that's going on, the, 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 the undeniable, indisputable level of massive criminality, the booming economy, and it's tied. I, I don't know, man. I don't, it, I'm, I'm uneasy. I'll be honest. We've been right about how bad it is. Rudy Giuliani uh, was forced to admit. Uh, that he lied uh, about those uh, those very conscientious poll workers who have been threatened with with uh, uh, guns and forced out of their house. Uh, Rudy doesn't give a goddamn. I mean, you know, uh, I hope he gets the book thrown at him on that. I hope he uh, has to pay those women a um, you know a lot of money. There is a lot of a lot of stirrings that Mark Meadows may be cooperating. Mark Meadows, former chief of staff of uh, Donald Trump, may be cooperating with Jack right. Smith. So they're, they're, they're shoes. And again, I don't think it's going to affect the, I, whatever it is, 30, 30, 32%. Um, but it's, uh, you know, it could, it could be some really, really bad stuff coming. It, it could. And there's been a lot of bad stuff come before. And, you know, look at, you uh, know, it, the, 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 the crazy. This, this whole Ray Epps thing was some guy from Phoenix who was a welder and his wife went to January 6th. They didn't break into the Capitol. And then Tucker started that he was an FBI plant. And they had to sue, they sued him. They had to have security. They had to change the whole life. And now this guy, I don't know him, Joe Rogan, who's an enormously popular podcast, as the Hunter Times audience we do, is saying the same thing. Yeah. And he's going to get sued too. But I, 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 I got you. So I, I can't. I'm, I'm at loss for an explanation. And, and of course, there's more coming. Well, stay tuned because uh, there is more coming, and uh, we're going to try to talk James off that ledge over the next uh, uh, month or two. I'm not maybe the best person to do it because I'm not at the ledge yet, but I'm at least at the window looking at that ledge. Um, so stay tuned. Our guest, we really have a distinguished guest today, Dr. Laura Tyson, one of the world's preeminent economists, the chair of the Council of Economic Advisors, 
during the Clinton administration and a professor extraordinaire at so many places, I can't list them. Uh, Laura, thank you so much for being with us. Um, let me start yes. off by saying you, uh, you told me the other day that you want to talk about the similarities between Bidenomics and Clintonomics. Now, mm -hmm. I, you not only know a lot more about economics than I do, but I'm sure your memory is a lot better than mine. But as I recall, 30 years ago, at the beginning of the Clinton administration, they were talking about worries about the deficit and the bond market. Carville said, <laughs> Yes, the bond market. <laughs> yeah, it's going to come back as the bond market. I don't think Joe Biden has spent a second thinking about the bond market in the last year. Well, and a half. He, 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 the differences. So, well, he has not had to until recently um, with the change in interest rates. So, I, when I think about the similarities, I want to say I think about them as broad Democratic Party or overarching goals. And, and by the way, we know that in the last few weeks, Marjorie Taylor Greene actually described them perfectly. Okay, these are goals that uh, existed and policy objectives that existed, follow the line in the Democratic Party from Franklin Roosevelt to Lyndon Johnson to Clinton, to Obama, to Biden. And so I just start with that. And what are those goals? They're investing in public infrastructure. They're investing in social infrastructure. Social infrastructure is education. Social infrastructure is science and research. Social infrastructure is medical help. Social infrastructure is poverty reduction. All of those things are goals of the Democratic Party and different presidents have had a different set of policies, but the goals are the same. And also, they've had different opportunities. Sometimes they can't move because of Republican opposition, because the capital market won't let them. Um, but I, I wanted to start out with the overarching goals and then talk about some of the differences in policies. You know, I, one of the ways that the Biden team keeps talking about distinction is we have a policy that builds from the bottom up and the middle out. I will say to James, doesn't that sound like putting people first? I mean, if you, <laughs> if you read the policy agenda of putting people first, it is bottom up and middle out. It is very much a middle class approach. It is very much a poverty reduction approach uh, through, for example, the earned income tax credit. So again, it, it's relabeled different terms. Uh, it's good to relabel, I think, but one should not lose the historical thread that connects Democratic Party objectives and then we can talk about different policies to achieve that. Well, I want you to just join in on that anytime you want to. But one one similarity is on the other side, you have a bunch of uh, born again Republican deficit virgins. Uh, they were yelling about it in 1993 and four, and they're now yelling we're going to bankrupt the country uh, yes. if we don't do something about entitlements. Is that as big an issue as they claim it is? It is. Is it? Tell me. I personally do not think it is. I never have thought it is. I think that uh, the capital markets, global capital markets, continue to welcome U.S. government debt. The government deficit of the United States and the assets we create because of that, the treasury bills, the treasury bonds, these very high-quality, low-risk assets that everybody wants to hold, you know, when Greenspan pointed out the importance of that, because when the Clinton team uh, signed the final deficit reduction budget act, which led to the be beginning of a budgetary surplus in the early 2000s, you know what Greenspan said? I'm worried about this. I don't want the government to be running a surplus because then it will be buying assets rather than selling assets. So um, just, I would say, Right now in the Republican Party, yes, there is a group like that. There's always been a group like that. They had a louder voice in the contract on America in 1993 and 94 and 95 than they have now. now. Now the Republican Party does not have a policy agenda. They don't care about policy. They, don't, they, they really don't care. They're about a person and a cult and a culture, culture wars. And 
they don't have an agenda. What, what's their policy agenda? I mean, yes, some of them want to do deficit reduction, but it's not an overwhelming kind of one message. That was certainly the message that was coming out of when Newt, Good, Newt Gingrich took control of the, of the Congress. No, no, I think you're absolutely right. Let me just force your number, James, one international question. Clinton paved the way for letting China in the WTO. Yes. How does that, how does that look today? Well, I believe that U.S.-China economic relations has had significant commercial benefits for both countries. I think if you look at the evidence, you would say overwhelmingly the U.S. gain and China gain. This was a win-win situation. Um, the, China did not destroy the U.S. industrial base. Uh, there were some examples, certainly, where import surges hurt communities. And by the way, it was written into the agreement with China that the U.S. could act in temporary ways to stop those surges. We did not. We chose not to use the guardrails that, we, that the Clinton administration put in place when it negotiated the agreement with China. So I think that... Uh, the benefits for the nation, the commercial benefits, have been very significant. I think some communities have been harmed. Some workers have been harmed. We did not do enough, and we had the tools to do stuff to help that transition, to help that transition. Now, if we fast forward to today, there's one other issue, which is really was not a major issue when we were dealing with China, and that is this national security aspect. So China understandably, completely understandably, has, from a development point of view, moved up the technology level to m much more sophistication, and their goal is to be leaders in that, those technologies. Um, many of them are dual-use technologies, uh, military technologies, and therefore, I think we have to now, as Janet Yellen said in her recent speech, we have to balance the national security concerns with China with the commercial benefits or the commercial relations we have with China. That, that's, that's new. That's new. We were not thinking about national security when we were negotiating China's accession to the WTO. James. So uh, let's just do some economic fantasy role playing. Let's assume that Laura Tyson is a junior in my class at LSU, and the title of the course is U.S. Economic Performance the Last 100 Years by Presidential P Political Party. Huh? Let's further assume that, that you're about honest, uh, thoughtful, illogical conservative, but you won't make stuff up. Mm -hmm. And... So I ask you a question. I said, this is not really close, is it? I mean, there's not. You, you've you read Professor Blinder's statistics, as, as I have. You've looked at the performance. You looked at it over 100 years. You looked at it since World War II. You looked at it since 1960. You looked at it in this century. What's the excuse? I mean, the, the Democratic Party is just kicking the living shit out of the Republican <laughs> Party on economic numbers. Yes. What would a principled conservative say in response to that? A principled conservative uh, might say, um, it's tough, we uh, need to worry about whether there's uh, too much regulation of business by government. We need to worry about whether government investment will crowd out private investment as opposed to crowd in private investment. We need to worry about, I would say, the long run issue that uh, over the course, and it really was dramatic under Reagan, what we managed to do, what Reagan managed to do with congressional help, is bring down taxes as a share of GDP but not bring down spending as a share of GDP. So that gap between spending and taxes persists to this day. It was created significantly under Reagan. Uh, and I, I would say that if we really wanted to achieve some of the very significant benefits 
that say in healthcare or education or family policy that say uh, Denmark achieves or Sweden achieves, we would have to tax more. And so a conservative might say, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. Therefore, I don't want to make those investments. But there is no, explain to our listeners just how democratic administrations have historically massively outperformed Republican administrations on every conceivable economic measure that we know about. And why does no one notice? I I would say (laughs) I'm very perplexed by why does no one notice. Because as you said, the data is pretty uh, clear. Even if we take the Clinton years, uh, we, we did manage. We, it was a very strong economy. Uh, we did, uh, I think, create a really positive environment for, in, for investment. Uh, we did um, invest in what, and I think this is true across Democratic administrations. So Janet Yellen made a really important distinction, which really hasn't caught on. But the Democratic, the Republican approach has been trickle down, just trickle down. We're going to just keep cutting taxes at the top, and somehow or other, all of that spending and investment and stuff will be generated by the top, and we'll lift all boats. That doesn't work. It simply doesn't work. <laughs> we, we have been, we the Democrats have been saying, uh, let's try to figure out ways to invest in the supply side. Okay, instead of trickle-down economics, which is a supply-side theory, you just trickle down the taxes and people take action. Um, the, the Biden approach, and within constraints, and the constraints were capital market constraints and political strengths, the Clinton approach was to say, let's make some government investments, and that will crowd in some private investments, right. and that will generate economic growth, and that will bring down the deficit, and that's it. I mean, that's, but you don't have that, any. There, there's no every piece of historical evidence that we know that we yes. actually know, yes. undisputedly, not any question about it. Right. Way more than the margin error says the economy under Democrats <laughs> profoundly outperforms the economy under Republican administrations. Is that a fact? Yes, but I will say, and now you're asking me as a conservative, I will say that the state of the economy when a president becomes president does matter. When Bill Clinton became president, it turned out, and it was not expected, but it turned out that the economy was on the brink of a productivity boom, largely as a result of the internet. And so the economy was going to grow much faster than anybody expected. Okay. If you go to, you know, now let's go to, to, let's go to to Roosevelt. So Roosevelt became president during a great depression. He put in policies, uh, tax policies, regulatory policies, and investment policy, spending policies, which actually rebooted the, the right. economy. Okay, so I think that um, it, it's important to say when a, when a president becomes president, what is the economic challenge uh, confronting that president? I think the Democrats clearly, as you said, have done a better job, a much better job, a yeah. remarkably much better job right. Right. over thank time. You. Yes, thank remarkably you. much that, better that, job. Thank you. Not, cl- not close. Uh, no, uh, not close. Not Ryan close. It's and not if really I, that close. No. And if I were in your LSE, LSE I class, I would have all the books and I would basically say, okay, um, here's the evidence. How do you right. explain this? Uh, yeah. And I think that my explanation is really twofold. Number one, I think the Democrats have the right policies. They're constantly trying to use policies to boost growth through boosting investment, private investment, investment in education, very, very important, investment in research and science, very important, investment in infrastructure, all of those things to boost growth. That's what they're trying to do. Whereas the Republicans are trying to cut the size of government 
and reduce taxes for the top in the hope that the reduction in taxes for the top will actually generate economic growth. And actually, we know that's not the case. Right. <laughs> so, well, thank you. A very, a very good job. You'd be commended for. Uh, <laughs> I used to be. I used to be a professor, James. I, I, I could do this. <laughs> I do. I do. go ahead. Yes, I, I know. I talk a little. I mean, you mentioned some of the. Um, uh, programs, achievements of the Biden administration, the chips manufacturing, uh, infrastructure, uh, right. green investments. Just pick one or two of them and talk about what impact you think they're going to have on America in the next, you know, five, okay. ten years. All right. But before I do, I, I actually want to say, because, again, I think James will uh, relate to this, uh, in putting people first and in what my uh, then uh, very close friend, Bob Reich, his voice in the administration was, we've got to spend much more on infrastructure. And by infrastructure, I mean not just uh, roads and bridges, but social infrastructure. By that, I mean health care and education. We have to spend much more. Uh, we were not able to spend much more. We were not able to spend much more. That was, I think, uh, to some extent, James's bond market, and to some extent, just the opposition, just simply the opposition. I mean, we could not get those things through, okay? Um, if we go to Bidenomics now, it is remarkable and a, a, an amazing achievement, and politically, you guys have to explain it. I, I really don't know how this happened. I mean, the, the infrastructure bill had, you know, Clinton was after an infrastructure bill. Um, Obama was after an infrastructure bill. Um, Trump was after an infrastructure bill. The one that got a serious infrastructure bill that really is now building out on the legacy of significant investments in public infrastructure was Biden. And I, I you know, it's, it's remarkable. CHIPS really has to do with um, national security. And the national security concern there is that China has said very clearly they want to be the dominant player in semiconductors and also semiconductors can be coded in ways where the privacy of the information flows can be completely decimated. So we, for national security reasons, I think the chips, there's a, there's a commercial element to this, but would we have had it without the national security concerns? I, I am not convinced that we would have had it. And then there's climate, and then there's the IRA. And again, amazing surprise, the biggest investment in environment and climate ever by any administration, uh, and uh, significant. These things together are already showing up in terms of a pivot in private investment. So the crowding in effect, okay, so, okay, companies are saying, okay, here's a tax credit. Here are a bunch of tax credits in the right. climate space. I'm going to do X, Y, and Z. I'm going to construct this. I'm going to build that. Um, and uh, that's also true with CHIPS, and it's also true with the Infrastructure Act. So um, these are very important. Now, they're very important, but... Um, most people will vote on the economy uh, depending upon the current conditions of the economy at the time of the election. And a lot of these investments take time to be accomplished. They just take time. It's, it's constructing a new fab for semiconductors in Arizona. That is, takes years. And the head of uh, TSMC, who is one of the major Taiwanese producers here, the major one, said, you know what, it's going to take five years and it's going to cost, you know, at least twice as much as they're estimating. It's not, it's, it's, so these are expensive and time-consuming investments. And a challenge for any president is, okay, the voter goes to the poll, well, how is the unemployment rate doing? How are my wages doing? How is inflation doing? How is my, you know, uh, not, not how is my, how is the country doing on achieving a long-term climate goal? So, so that's the risk here. Professor Tyson, grade uh, the performance of Federal Reserve Chairman Jay Powell over the last year and a half, and how he is doing right now. Okay, all right, I will do that again. I want to start with because I think a lot about Bidenomics in terms of Clintonomics. And you will remember, uh, James will certainly remember, you'll remember, 
that we were playing in the Clinton administration this very this this dance with Alan Greenspan, and Alan was essentially kind of telling us, uh, without being a, a promise, if you guys do something serious on trying to bring the deficit under control, say in five years, he wasn't saying immediately, but say a five year period, then I'm telling you that I will bring interest rates down. They were very high then, okay? So uh, the interaction of a democratic administration with a Federal Reserve, whether the Federal Reserve is run by a Republican nominee, as Allen was, or a Democratic nominee, as Jerome was, um, it, does, it doesn't matter. You, you, you have to sort of... Uh, Fiscal policy and monetary policy have to kind of work together. So essentially, uh, in the case of PAL, um, the administration basically first put through the American Rescue Act and then uh, very quickly put through these other bills. A lot of economic stimulus, a lot, a lot, a lot. Unprecedented economic stimulus is a share of GDP, period, Okay. Uh, Powell didn't say anything about it. I mean, Powell is not focused the way Alan Greenspan was focused on that. Uh, then we have this unexpected, uh, and it was unexpected by almost all economists. Uh, Larry Summers will say not by him, but maybe not by him, but by everybody else. Uh, unexpected surge in inflation. And of course, at the end of the day, the only tools we have in town to combat inflation pretty much are, lie with the Federal Reserve. So, so Jerome Powell starts, and some people criticize him as going too slow. I personally do not. He starts to realize, okay, I have to start to raise rates to get inflation under control, and I want to do this in a gradual way, which does not completely tank the economy. And I think so far he's doing a remarkably good job. I mean, he may pull off uh, what the very rare event of a soft landing, and the soft landing would be you slow the economy down a bit, you slow the inflation rate down more, and the unemployment rate doesn't rise very much. Woo! If, and so far the economy looks to be on that track. So, so far, I give them really high marks. I give well, them very high marks. Let me put it another way then. What do you know, what keeps you up at night? I mean, after you finished your husband's novel, uh, <laughs> uh, what keeps you up at night? What's your worry? Do you think okay. maybe in the middle of 2024 that recession could finally hit or downturn? It's certainly uh, the macroeconomist's major concern is that the – recession we think we're avoiding, actually, we don't avoid. And um, I, I think right now what you've had happen here, and uh, Chairman Powell mentioned this the other day, is their very own forecasters t had a recession predicted for the last quarter of this year, and they took it out. They now have just, we're growing through the last quarter. There is still the possibility that in the next two rounds of Fed policy, if the inflation rate does not continue to go down, if it seems to stabilize at, say, four or five, depending upon which number you're looking at, that's still too high, uh, then I would say there would be a couple more interest rate increases, and then that raises the risk of recession. There's nothing that the Biden administration can do about that. That's not, uh, it, it, if that happens, that will be because of monetary policy trying to slow the economy down. Um, so the Biden administration has to worry about that, uh, uh, but there's nothing in a sense that it can do about that. It, it, um, it has tried through the Strategic Petroleum Reserve to occasionally bring energy prices down. Um, it, it tries in a variety of small ways to sort of deal with supply chain issues. But by the way, most of the supply chain issues, and they did a very good job, the Commerce Department did a very good job here, are over now. Supply chains are fine. The, the supply chains are working. Right. Um, so I do worry. Uh, that's that's one thing I worry about is recession. Uh, a second thing I worry about, and, and this one I maybe worry about more, is a U.S.-China conflict uh, over Taiwan. And I I personally feel that the national security, the tone of national security comments in um, 
in the Biden administration is much more of a kind of, this is a risk, this is a concern, this is real, instead of a kind of effort to negotiate, it's an effort to raise uh, concerns. And we're not being helped in that regard by President Xi either. So the Chinese leadership is exactly the same in this regard. So that's probably the thing that keeps me up the most at night is, is U.S.-China relations uh, with a incident over Taiwan. James. So, there's a professor, this is something I've known in my years in Washington. A Democrat or a commentator left of center loves to admit error on our side. So, you, this is the argument that you'll get. Yeah, the, the Biden spending early helped a lot of people, but Jim, when, of course, some people call me Jim, I know they're full of shit. So, Jim, <laughs> you, you have to admit that this was too, it was too much expending and it, it was inflationary and caused high inflation. I, I looked at inflation rates around the world. Canada, yes. which is kind of, you know, an economic yeah. brother or sister of ours or Western Europe. But we just have to admit it. You're not mm-hmm. a serious person unless you say something, you know, un, you know, people, people go to Clinton and go, what pissed you off about the Clinton administration? A piece of the prosperity. Something really irritated you. I don't know which one it is. That you were right. making a lot of money or you won't get jazz shot off. <laughs> but why is this constant need among mm-hmm. left of center policy walks and commentators to always look for some error, even if it's not there? Do you, do you, have you noticed this in your professional career? And does it drive you as crazy as it drives me? <laughs> I, I don't think. Interestingly, I don't think there are that many voices like that. I, I think what's interesting is that on inflation, which is the major issue that you would say, okay, the, the Biden administration made a mistake, it spent too much, the stimulus was too big, it created inflation. On that issue, almost everyone agrees that a lot of this was supply-side pandemic. And... And we were better off trying to grow faster out of the recession from the pandemic by taking the risk that there might be a little inflation. We, we, got, we got out of the pandemic. We recovered much more rapidly than the other developed countries. And we did that because we stimulated the economy. We absolutely did. And, and, so, and, and Biden had learned from the Obama situation that when you go slow uh, after a big recession, it takes a very long time for people to find jobs and for people to recover the value of their property and for people to recover uh, their consumption levels. The economy did not recover from 2008 until 2019. Until 2019. That was a failure, I would say, of a Obama's policies, but also what he was allowed to do, what he could do. The con- there just was not room for that kind of stimulus. But now, I would say most people kind of feel like, uh, yeah, okay, we got some inflation from this, but it doesn't seem it's coming down. Inflation expectations are pretty well controlled. Um, the chairman of the Fed himself is saying it's not the result, it's supply side and demand side. I don't think they're, I've been amazed and happy because I think the criticism has been muted correctly, correctly. I don't think right. if you, yeah, right. Right. I, I, I guess I'm not going to, there's no argument to have here. I, I Just looking at inflation in the U.S. and inflation around the world, yeah. I think it's hard to even people said, well, it's Fannie Mae and Freddie that caused the housing. Well, why did the housing collapse in Spain? Mm-hmm. Why did it collapse in the UK? I, I mean, it's always, it was the, the Carter administration b- lending that caused. It was, it was actually black people that caused the, the housing market to crater. It wasn't a bunch of stupid, unregulated, greedy, slimy people. But, but James, I will say on this, we haven't talked about this, and I... All right, go ahead. Uh, in... In the Clinton era, the second term, I wasn't there, but I'm not saying I don't bear any responsibility for it. We, we did some things which really did contribute to the great financial crisis. We eased the Glass-Steagall Act. 
which set up this whole kind of investment banking and commercial banking thing. And we actually also, you know, the, the credit default swaps, which were behind that, we, we chose to make a decision against advice, against the device of the female head of the CF, CDFC, I think, to not regulate credit default swaps. Just not regulate them. What? So, so we, you can, I think that again, what what does a um, what does an administration inherit? In in this case, let's take Silicon Valley Bank because Silicon Valley Bank was a complete surprise to everyone, really was, and the administration acted absolutely overnight uh, to basically make sure that deposits uh, all deposits were safe because so many small businesses and large businesses had their payroll on deposit at Silicon Valley Bank. And they were not insured. Those deposits were not insured unless the government decided to insure them. And the government said, we're insuring them. And um, then is now deeply involved in trying to figure out, okay, how do we regulate those banks going forward? So I guess my point of that is what an administration can do on the fiscal policy side depends very much on the capital market conditions. It goes right to your point, James. It was the bond market was a significant constraint on the Clinton administration. Absolutely. Um, the bond market, the capital markets, the Fed has not been a significant constraint on the Biden administration. And, um, and what I be- mean by that is the constraint is on the economy or on the policies that um, a uh, president can pursue. So we're in, the president has been in good shape in terms of how capital markets have behaved, the kinds of regulations he's put in place, and the Fed policy, which has been very wise. Well, uh, th- thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Tyson. It's an honor to have you. And just to restate the economy in any measure is significantly, significantly overperformed under Democratic re- presidents for whatever Absolutely. reason. Absolutely. Okay. I accept thank that you, completely. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> My to your terrific husband, tell him I'm still blushing over reading his novel, but uh, <laughs> we, I tell you how much we appreciate it. Yeah, I hope we'll see you sometime soon. Thank you. All right. Well, it was a pleasure, and I look forward to teaching James's class some point. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I guess I guess that's right, sure. All Thank right. You. Take care, you guys. Thank Take you. care. Right. James, you might recall a couple of months ago, uh, I mentioned uh, Tricia Cotham, who was a North Carolina Democratic state legislator, le- legislator, pro-choice, anti-gun, you know, basically a mainstream Democrat, who suddenly switched parties to the Republican Party, giving the Republicans a veto proof or giving them the, the ability to override any of Governor Cooper's vetoes. And we raised the question, why? There's more to it than that. We found out this week, good reporting by the New York Times and North Carolina site, uh, this was a, this was a, a, a fix. Uh, she conspired with the Republicans before she ran that basically said, let me get in and then I'll, I'll, I'll defect. I'll go to you and I'll, you know, play a game for a while. Uh, it really was, uh, you know, to coin a phrase, deplorable uh, what she did. It was disingenuous, if not dishonest. She's a woman who stood up on the floor uh, as a Democrat and gave an impassioned speech for women's rights on reproductive health. Uh, she said uh, she looked at those legislators and, uh, you know, she said, uh, you know, my body is my own, basically. And then when she switched, she cast a deciding vote for a very strict uh, I suspect we're going to find out more about what um, Trisha Cotham got but it really is uh, an ugly, ugly story. I, well, my outrage is, goes to this. In a, it's, it's, my, my, my general outrage is Democrats and left-leaning commentators always go out of their way to try to bring some kind of equivalency to an argument. 
as you know, the commentator who I probably agree with more than any other, and that's because this person produces a lot of copy and generally really, really like about 80% of what he does is Jonathan Chait, who writes for New York Magazine. But Jonathan Chait is not above this both siderism bullshit, where he says the sleaze problem has dem- Democrats can change Supreme Court, can clean up Supreme Court and address the Hunter Biden affair. Okay, so John Chait is technically right. The Hunter Biden affair is, is, is sleazy, all right? The difference is the Supreme Court actually has power, which Hunter Biden does not. Mm-hmm. And, and I know in every word that he puts in his column, it's probably true. He's not a guy who's going to say something inaccurate. But he always have to say, yeah, you know, the Harlan Crow, of course, the John Roberts stuff, which I think is beyond awful. Alito getting a softball interview from a guy who has a case before the Supreme Court. But trust me, the Jonathan Cates and the commentariat will say, yeah, but on the other hand, you got to admit, there's a district judge in Oregon who did X. And it just, I don't understand the reflex that people have to make things more even than they should be. And, and, and Jonathan Shade is a very smart man. He knows the difference between a sleazy kid and an entire branch of government. But yet, in order to be in the club, we got to say, you know, look at that speck in your eye, and it happens over and over and over and over again. I, if I if I were a younger person, I'd go out and raise money and put the, the National Bureau to, in opposition to bullshit false equivalents. You take one little thing, and you say, well, it's true, I've said that. You're right. The deficit, you know, the jobs go up under Democratic administrations and, and, and Republican administrations. Yeah, they go up 300 times faster than Democratic administrations. So you're technically true to say that, but is that really the first thing you want to say? And it, they just got to do that. It, 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 it's part of the freaking DNA. Yeah, oh, yeah, you got, you, everybody knows you got a Hunter Biden problem. I don't know any Democrat that defends Hunter Biden and what he did. And of course, they're making up the stuff about Joe Biden have anything to do with it. Joe Biden actually has power. You know, you can pick your friends. You can't pick your relatives. Uh, I don't know. It just pissed me off. Yeah, good point. And now let's do our screw the voter thing. Uh, once again, the invaluable Brennan Center has come through uh, a lease Clapman and I think it's Yuri Rudensky have written a piece on what Ohio is doing. Ohio is one of the most corrupt states in the country. Uh, the Ohio Republicans have gone and they've, they've just fixed gerrymandering to an atrocious, atrociously partisan degree. Uh, they've enacted all kinds of bad laws. Uh, to it. One of their speakers is in, former speakers is in the slammer. Uh, another faces, um, uh, faces penalties. Uh, and the one recourse that opponents have in that stack state is a referendum. Well, now they want to go and see if they can block that. So what the Republicans have done is they put on the ballot in August, when they figure people are on vacation, a referendum that says it's going to be much harder to ever approve another referendum. A, you're going to have to have 60 votes, 60 percent rather, rather than 50 and B, it's going to be a lot harder to get the signatures required to get there. Uh, this is obviously an attempt to prevent uh, progressives from enacting either uh, pro-choice or gerrymandering or other measures. But it's really, really, uh, uh, it's outrageous that they're doing this and why they're doing it. And I would remind them that only a year ago, Kansas Republicans decided to do the same thing. Let's have a referendum in August when no one votes and will win. They lost, I think, next Tuesday uh, that I'm looking for Ohio Democrats to come out, independents and, and, and well-intended Republicans 
and defeat this effort to really thwart the people's will in Ohio? Well, first of all, there's considerable evidence that they're well. I was reading some stuff to early vote. I know you got to be careful, but it's stunningly high. As you know, I had on-the-ground experience in Kansas. And if they're in an higher, if, if they run in this about the sneaky legislation, Columbus bending over to the will of these right wing preachers to take power away from you, you'll get, you'll win hugely. You don't, you don't even need to use the word abortion. All you got to do is sneaky politicians trying to take power away from you or sneak one by you. And mm-hmm. I, I'm pretty confident that that's what they're doing. And I'm pretty confident they're going to win at this thing. Well, good. Let's hope. All right, James. Now for our listener questions, which we always look forward to. David in Miami says, can't the Senate Democrats open investigations into Jared, Ivanka, et cetera, to counter the House investigations into the Bidens? Why don't they take the two can play this game approach? Well, I guess they could. My attitude is let the House have it to themselves. This thing just keeps blowing up in its stupid faces, not hurting anything. If anything, it's helping. And you know, you have some uh, credible reason to believe that the stories about Jim Jordan are not over yet. Mm-hmm. This guy, Coma, is, is I wouldn't call him a, a, a man of modest ability. I'd call him a giant fool. And and our people exaggerate on the house side are as good as they can be. You can't get any better than Dan Goldman. You can't get any better than uh, Plaskett, the lady from the Virgin Islands. You can't get any any better than Jamie Raskin. I I wouldn't get in their way. I'd hold that coat. I, 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 go ahead. Investigate what the hell you want to investigate. Every time you do it, you, you make an idiot of yourself. And I, I wouldn't get I, – I, I understand w- w- what you're saying, but – I, I think we're doing just fine <laughs> right now. <laughs> Good point. Uh, Gary in Paris, France. Mm. I remember hearing Carter, Jimmy Carter in 75, and he said, I have been to Paris, France, as opposed to Paris, Kentucky or Paris, Texas. Right. Anyway, Gary in Paris, France says, Biden may have been the only Democratic candidate that could defeat Trump in 2016. Now it could be the other way around and risks are just too great for this country with very dire consequences for our way of life to take such a gamble. I just hope he, meaning Biden, will come to his senses and realize this. Gary, it ain't going to happen, I'm afraid. Uh, I don't disagree with your thesis, uh, but I, uh, I think uh, he's, uh, he's in for the ride uh, unless something happens to his health. And his people have been saying, hey, it's going to be Trump, be Biden, and Biden is going to be Trump. So uh, your wish uh, is not a um, is not a marginal one, but it's not going to happen. Well, I, I, I'm not sure if I'm as certain as you are, but I, I certainly doesn't seem very likely. I had a guy one time I knew told me he didn't like Paris. I said, I have no interest in speaking to you for the rest of my life. If you're so goddamn stupid you don't like Paris, then something else is wrong with you. That's a that's a great city you live in, and I think I'm going to be getting there in September, and I've gone multiple times, and it's, it's all it's cranked up to be. And I'll just I leave it love at that. Paris, but I got to tell you, I love Rome more. Uh, I think they're both great cities, uh, and I think it's not because Rome is a better city, but I like the Italians more. Yeah, I don't know, I, but I know. <laughs> Nice choices. I like plenty of places. Tom and Susan in Memphis, Tennessee, says, Bill Clinton is my wife and my favorite president and always will be. That said, we have found a new favorite, Brandon Presley, running for governor of Memphis. <laughs> he reminds us greatly of Bill. Both started poor and worked hard to make an impact. I'm going to send you his ad since it's the best we've seen since Bill ran. Please get the Democratic Party behind him, will they? I am going to yield totally. James Carville on this, because as he knows, 
Uh, my son, Benjamin, is actually working for Brandon Presley. So, James, you can be the detached analyst on well, this one. I, I, I share your enthusiasm for Brandon. And by the way, people who listen to this show, uh, plug into that race. You might want to send a, 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 a shackle or two down Mississippi's way. And let me tell you, this race matters because the first thing that Brandon will do if he's governor is institute Medica- Medicaid and, and save a probably 400,000 people, you know, if you extrapolate out that would have health care in Mississippi, which is, of course, the poorest state, and it has not expanded this. Uh, the other thing is there's a horrific, I want to say, 7.5% on, on sales tax on groceries, which is yeah. the most regressive, sickening tax, particularly in a state that has staggering high levels of poverty. Brandon Presley went into this race, I don't have any doubt in assuring every person listening to this show, so many lives, hundreds of thousands of lives of, of despair are going to make be made appreciably better. And that's what's at stake here. We certainly have a, a, a superb chance. Uh, it was at a famous Neshoba County fad that's held every year. It was uh, Reagan went and made it you know, really famous. Of course, that was a tragic shooting of Michael Swearing and uh, James Cheney and I forgot the other guy. We're trying to forget. Mm-hmm. And and uh, they said the the crowds were almost as big for Brandon as they were for for Tate Reese, which is remarkable as you think about it. Because it, it, I'm sure it's a, a overwhelmingly white crowd in the in the Mississippi the Republican primaries for for everything. So I, the polling evidence, the polling is is very tight, and the anecdotal evidence to me is confirming that this is going to be a tight and very 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 important race. Right. You're right, and thank you for that very astute observation. Thank them both. I mean, it's husband and wife. They're both in there. Yeah. Uh, they're big Clinton and they're big Presley fans. Stop by the Rendezvous Barbecue, my good friend John Vergos. Good, good man. Right. Chad in and- Birmingham, Alabama says, I have recently begun to see things about the Heritage Foundation's Project 2025. From what I've read, it's extremely conservative and I feel like not enough people are talking about it. Can you explain to all of us just what Project 2025 is? Boy, Chad, you have hit the nail with this one, I'll tell you. It's a $22 million project that right-wingers led by Heritage are putting on to basically, if Trump should be elected, they're going to lay the groundwork for some policies that will end, as they say, the deep state. They'll also end any climate policy. Uh, It'll eliminate uh, much-needed agencies. Uh, It'll make it much easier for presidents to uh, get rid of uh, people who are protected now. Uh, uh, and it's going to make sure in personnel that there are no Jim Mattises around. They're only going to be Trump cult uh, followers. Everybody ought to look at Project 2025. It really is alarming, James. I, I, the whole thing's alarming. I, I, I mean, if you look at the amount of money like the Heartland Institute spends, is somebody right now, how in the world, are, are these people still being climate deniers or, or trying to de-gut the regular? I mean, I mean all right, it's the hottest month in the history of the freaking world. What else do you need? And, and they're gone. They're giving hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars for this kind of bullshit. And I don't, I mean, I, I, I don't know what to say. There's just a lot of stupid fucking people in this world. I, 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 thanks for the question. Uh, it's an astute observation. But as long as you got greedy people giving a lot of money to to tell stupid people what they want to hear, there's always a danger in this country, and that's the danger. Yeah, it sure is. David in Germantown, Tennessee. We have a we oh, have yeah, a that, that that's East Memphis. A southern lilt to uh, today's uh, questions. Many Democrats are giddy about Trump's le- many legal woes and are hoping this may tank his candidacy, David says. But that would only mean he'll be replaced by another Republican candidate. Don't you think that just about any Republican has a better chance to defeat Biden than Trump? In other words, Democrats should be careful what they wish for. Uh, any is a big word. All right. I, actually, I... The, the one thing that Trump does bring that makes him is, is they'll come out for him. They're not going to come out for DeSantis. 
And, and don't even get me started on the Tim Scott, Glenn Youngkin boomlet. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> guess what? Where are these people? In every Tim Scott is safe harbor for now. You got Ross Duhar. Oh well, but about Ken and you know, and of course these people can't stomach Trump. Of course they, they they can't stomach Democrats either. Is Tim Scott has become the favorite flavor of the day? Tim Scott, a a, a man with almost no legislative accomplishments, a person who. But is saying that he believes in abstinence is a way of life. Boy, you can really relate to people with that, or that—that's a really big deal. Out well, there. James, to- just, I think he said after 16 years and 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 public life, he he then lost his virginity, but maybe only once. Okay, well, gee whiz. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I it's it, it, it's weird, man. It's really, really, really profoundly weird Mm -hmm. and the whole operation is from the candidates to the voters to you name it this is this is a strange bunch the the republican party of the united states in 2023 i it's it's inexplicable i don't ask me i i i agree totally David in Livingston, New Jersey, said there's been much press this week about Trump using campaign donations to cover his legal bills and bills of his conspirators. Uh, Putting aside the questionable ethics, why isn't the use of money to cover personal legal fees income to him uh, such that he has to pay taxes? Well, it's not. I mean, there's been a lot of rulings on this, and there's two places. His campaign, of course, can spend money on anything uh, that affects him, including his legal bills. But the PAC is the one, the outside group, which supposedly is independent from Trump. Of course, it's not. Uh, they they are the ones that are given big money, and uh, unfortunately, it's totally legal. It is incredibly unethical, as you say, David, because they raised that money, a lot of that money, by saying they wanted to use it to protest the fraudulent 2020 outcome. They haven't used any of it for that. Instead, they're using it to try to protect him now from uh, the quadruple indictments that he faces. So unethical, yes. Uh, illegal, I'm afraid, no. You know what's... Uh fascinating is there are all these stories about how they misuse their contributions and they shut legal fees and they do this and everything. The people that send Trump money don't care. They want to be stolen from. He's going to take it. He's going to steal it. He's going to put it to, you know, give it to his friends. He's going to give it to his lawyers. He's going to give it to anything. And they don't care. They, They really do not care. If, if, if Trump wants to lie to him, great. If he wants to steal from him, great. So steal it all, man. You've been doing it. You've been doing it all before. Keep on stealing. They don't care. And, and they, they shouldn't complain because if you send sending Trump money now and after everything you know, whew, you, you need to have your head checked. Final question to you, James. Jameson in Chicago, Illinois raises the possibility of replacing Dianne Feinstein, the senator from California, with Kamala Harris. Well, you'd have to assume that Kamala Harris would go along with this. Yeah. Which is highly doubtful. doubtful. His Gavin Newsom promised that he would appoint a a, a woman of color to to this position. I I, I think he has. He has, definitely. I, I I'm, I'm all for appointing women of color to this or that. I, 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 just, I just wish people would just say, I'm going to appoint, you know, whoever I think is the most qualified person, and then uh, kaboom. And, and look, what's one of the things that I'm, I'm working on is this piece about this Biden's nominees, that black guy be chairman of the Joint Chiefs. God, what a qualified guy. Whew. I mean, I mean, I mean, there's so many to me, and this is something I probably people will disagree and I understand that. When, when you know, as our friend Walt Delger pointed out, that there's so many. You know, 40 years ago, this wasn't the case. There's so many talented uh, black women lawyers now. It's not even exceptional. It's it, it's part of. It's part of the thing, so I, I I just wish to just just do it. Don't 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 tell us. Just just do it. 
And uh, it, it's nothing special or remarkable that you find pe- people like this with that, that got these huge qualifications. But uh, I'm not sure that I don't think Vice President Harris is looking to go back to the Senate. Well, I, th- I think you're right. Hey, keep those questions coming in. We love them. If we didn't get to them this week, there's a good chance we'll get to them next week. Hey, thanks for listening to Politics World Room with James Carville, and I'm Al Hunt. Don't forget to send your questions for us by email to politicswarroom at gmail.com or tweet them for next week's show at Politicon. Following this episode, we'd appreciate it if you check out the links to recent sponsors in the recent episode show notes. We deeply thank you for supporting them because when you do, it helps make this podcast happen. To keep up with us, subscribe to Politics War Room on Apple Podcast, Spotify, or wherever you listen. You also can find other shows you might enjoy on the Politicon YouTube channel or when you search Politicon on your favorite podcast sites. Remember, please rate the show with a five-star review, and we'll be back next week with another show as we continue our war room planning. 